On World News Tonight, the bomb cyclone. The strongest storm ever recorded targets 41 million people in the US. Is there a deal? US President one step closer to the infrastructure deal as he meets with the key senators. Taiwan shakeup. A quake rattled the capital of Taiwan, leaving buildings unstable. Halloween happiness. A generous heart helps kids around the country with a pumpkin patch. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with what's being called the strongest storm recorded off the West Coast. California and Nevada are bracing for a bomb cyclone combined with an influx of extratropical moisture. The storm is gaining strength and already causing massive damage in areas that have recently been scarred by raging wildfires. In Northern California tonight, bracing for impact. A monster storm marching across the West. 41 million at risk for flash flooding, mudslides, and high winds. Forecasters calling it the strongest storm ever recorded off the West Coast. What's to blame? A swift and massive drop in air pressure called a bomb cyclone, combined with an influx of extratropical moisture. The mix creating a catastrophic weather system, already wreaking havoc on California's highways. The terrain loose and charred after historic wildfires like this one last year in the Santa Cruz Mountains. The area now being evacuated. The debris flow is a, is a concern as well, but also down trees are a huge concern, down power lines, even if it, you know, a tree doesn't land on your house per se. Though some still choosing to stay. We've got easily a week worth of supplies to get us through. North of Sacramento, the town of Paradise still devastated from the fires there. Residents prepping and praying they'll be spared. A little shaken up. But uprooted trees already taking a toll. Basically the whole roof is it collapsed and wow. exposed to the weather on the inside. Fear of what the next few hours will bring now rippling through a region that so desperately needed rain. But the storm only providing more pain. Still in the U.S., Democrats are working on a deal for a massive social spending and climate plan. After months of negotiations, President Biden met with Senate Majority Leader Schumer and Senator Manchin to finalize the framework. Democrats inching closer to a deal on a massive social spending and climate plan. President Biden hosting a critical meeting at his Delaware home today with Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senator Joe Manchin. An agreement within reach. We've 90 percent of the bill agreed to and written. We just have some of the last uh, decisions to be made. And after months of negotiations, a final framework forming. What likely stays? Universal pre-K, child care and elder care funding. What's likely out? Free community college and Medicare expansion to cover dental, hearing and vision. What's limited? The length of the child tax credit and paid family leave reduced from 12 weeks to four. It is less than we had projected to begin with, but it's still bigger than anything we have ever done in, in, in terms of addressing the needs of America's working families. But two senators have been key holdout votes, Kirsten Cinema of Arizona and West Virginia's Manchin, who rejected a larger price tag and certain climate proposals in the bill. We're almost there. It's just the language of it, but it will be, it will um, not offend, shall we say, uh, the concern that uh, Senator Manchin had. The president eager to have a commitment before Thursday when he departs for two major economic and climate summits, hoping to tout legislative progress on his agenda on the world stage. The Canadian Coast Guard said that it's monitoring a fire that broke out on a container ship off the coast of Victoria, British Columbia, and is working with the U.S. Coast Guard to assess the situation. A container fire off the coast of British Columbia, Canada, appears to be under control. That's according to Canadian Coast Guard Commander J.J. Brickett on Sunday. 
the company itself is reporting that the majority of the fire is actually out. Uh, we still see it smoldering. What they were attempting to do is let the fire burn down. In other words, the, the container consume itself with the fuel while keeping everything else around it cool so that they wouldn't ignite. When we are looking at the imagery, we can't see any scorching or charring of those adjacent containers. That's a really good sign. In a statement earlier on Sunday, the company that manages the container ship, Dano Shipping, said no injuries had been reported. 16 crew members were evacuated from the MV Zim Kingston after the fire broke out earlier in the weekend, while five remained on board to fight the fire. Tugboats were seen spraying water around the fire to contain it. The ship is anchored several miles off the southern coast of Vancouver Island. Officials have ensured that residents are safe and commercial ports are still in operation. Canada's Coast Guard said it's been working with its U.S. counterpart to track 40 containers that had fallen overboard after bad weather on Friday, more of which is expected to hit the region Sunday. Mariners are advised to stay clear of the area. A large fleet of Chinese and Russian warships have conducted their first joint patrols in the Pacific Ocean, sailing through Japan's Osumi Strait. The defense ministries of the two countries said the drill was aimed at contributing to peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific region, but not everyone feels that was their true intent. Boasting of close bilateral ties amid the prolonged escalation of tension between Washington and Beijing, Russia and China reportedly staged naval cooperation drills earlier this month, traversing the Pacific Ocean and East China Sea. According to Japan's Kyoto News Agency Sunday, 10 vessels from China and Russia sailed through the Osumi Strait off Japan's southwestern prefecture of Kagoshima. It added this was the first time that Tokyo's defense ministry confirmed a flotilla of Chinese and Russian vessels passing through the strait, which is regarded as international waters. This means foreign ships are allowed to navigate, but Tokyo said it will continue to monitor the two navies, describing the maneuvers as, quote, unusual. The warships are believed to have taken part in a joint naval drill in the area in mid-October. Over the weekend, Russia's defense ministry said the patrols were aimed at maintaining regional peace and stability. On Sunday, China's defense ministry said they were aimed at further enhancing the China-Russia comprehensive strategic partnership in the new era and to jointly maintain international and regional strategic stability. Myanmar's junta said that it would not engage in talks with coup dissidents, including members of Aung San Suu Kyi's ousted government, after a loyalist said dialogue was necessary to save the country. On the way to becoming a failed state, the starkest warning yet from the UN as Myanmar continues sliding into chaos. In its latest report on the brutal crackdown, the UN details eyewitness accounts of mass troop movements in the northwest, a move analysts say is aimed at crushing local resistance. It's targeting uh, particularly the Chin, who are ferocious fighters, but unlike the other ethnic armed organizations, are poorly equipped. Um, so it's going to try and attack the, so the weakest link. The UN's special rapporteur on Myanmar, Tom Andrews, told the General Assembly on Friday that the world's inaction would probably lead to more mass atrocities. He added that Myanmar's people believed the world and the UN no longer cared. One thing's for sure, more and more countries are switching strategies, preferring to engage with the ruling military junta rather than shutting them out altogether. A change in tactics, more or less admitted by the U.S. at a recent summit of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. You know, look, that's why we're here, is to think through what's the way forward, what could actually work to try to change the, the, the outlook of the junta, but then also, um, you know, how can we do so in a way that doesn't make our problems worse? The military junta itself is still excluded from the summit. Neighboring countries accuse the army of carrying out massive human rights violations since it took power in a coup back in February. More than 1,000 civilians have been killed since then, and thousands more have been thrown behind bars. The UN says that torture is widespread, and even children haven't been spared. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. A magnitude 6.5 earthquake slammed northeastern Taiwan, with residents reporting violent shaking in the capital, Taipei. 
Buildings shook in Taipei on Sunday as a 6.5 magnitude earthquake struck northeastern Taiwan. There were no reports of damage. The quake had a depth of 41 and a half miles and could be felt across the northern, eastern and western parts of Taiwan with the epicenter in Yilan County, according to the Weather Bureau. The Taipei Metro was briefly closed for checks but reopened shortly afterwards. The state-run power operator said the grid was operating as normal, while the railway administration said it was carrying out track inspections. TSMC, the world's largest contract chipmaker, said it had evacuated some workers. Taiwan lies near the junction of two tectonic plates and is prone to earthquakes. More than 100 people were killed in a quake in southern Taiwan in 2016, while a 7.3 magnitude quake killed more than 2,000 people in 1999. Israel announced plans to build more residences for Jewish settlers in the occupied West Bank, drawing immediate condemnation from Palestinians, peace activists and neighbouring Jordan. For the Palestinian Authority, another outrage from Israel as it moves forward with plans to build over 1,300 new homes in the West Bank, adding to previous projects already approved. The Palestinians have long sought the West Bank, along with Gaza and East Jerusalem, as part of their future state. Israel captured those areas during the 1967 war, and every government since then has continued settlement expansion. Some 475,000 Israeli Jews live in West Bank settlements, which have long been considered illegal by the international community. Ahead of the announcement, Israel's main backer, the United States, expressed its concern at warnings of the latest developments. We believe it is critical for Israel and the Palestinian Authority to refrain from unilateral steps that exacerbate tension and undercut efforts to advance a negotiated two-state solution. This certainly includes settlement activity, as well as retroactive legalization uh, of settlement outposts. For Palestinian anti-settler groups, it demonstrates a continuation of old policies under Prime Minister Naftali Bennett's coalition government. Bennett, for his part, opposes Palestinian statehood and has already ruled out formal peace talks preferring to focus on economic improvements. France has successfully launched a state-of-the-art satellite into orbit, designed to allow all of France's armed forces across the globe to communicate swiftly and securely. For more on this, we have other there in the World News special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting now from Normandy in France. Chetana. Yuzhan Radi, French Air and Space Force spokesman Colonel Stéphane Speck said that the satellite is designed to resist military aggression from the ground and in space, as well as in interference. The Aaron 5 rocket carrying the Cross 4A satellite took off from Kourou in French Guiana with mission accomplished 30 minutes and 41 seconds after takeoff. The satellite can serve in its close surroundings and move from itself to escape an attack. The satellite was also protected against the electromagnetic pulses which would result from a nuclear explosion. Last year, the US claimed that the Russia had conducted a non-destructive anti-satellite weapons test from space. In March, French President Emmanuel Macron's office said that there had been other similar incidents since but gave no details. Investments in France's space program are set to reach 4.3 billion euros over the 2019 to 2025 budgets. Back to you, Anurag. All right, thank you. That was other there in the World News special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Britain's hospitals are already struggling to cope with an influx of patients ahead of an anticipated winter crisis. Let's cross over to other there in the World News special correspondent Malshi Abe Sekra reporting now from Norwich in the United Kingdom. Malshi? Yes, Anuradhi. The country recorded the highest number of new cases of COVID 19 since July over the past week. Government figures showed a day after Prime Minister Boris Johnson played down the prospect of a return to lockdown. The president of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, Catherine Henderson, stated that emergency departments were already struggling to cope and that this is not something that's coming in the next couple of months, emphasising that the country is already in a terrible place. While vaccination and better medical treatment have sharply reduced deaths compared with previous waves of the disease, Hospitals are already stretched, and Britain's current death rate is far higher than many of its European neighbours. Government health advisers said that preparations should be made for the possible reintroduction of measures to slow the spread of the disease.
such as working from home, as acting early would reduce the need for tougher measures later. Boris Johnson, however, said he did not expect a return to lockdown. Back to you, Anurathi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News special correspondent, Malshia Besekra, reporting from Norwich in the UK. There is some good news for the United States as COVID infections are down a whopping 50% since the peak in September and just days from now, a COVID vaccine could be approved for kids aged 5 to 11. So brave. Pfizer's COVID vaccine for kids could be ready for a nationwide rollout in a matter of weeks. FDA advisors will meet Tuesday to vote on emergency use authorization, a critical step in the regulatory process. It's entirely possible, if not very likely, that vaccines will be available for children from 5 to 11 within the first week or two of November. Pfizer reported their kid-sized doses are 91% effective. Health regulators review the drug maker's data and their analysis shows that the vaccine's benefit for preventing hospitalization and death outweigh potential side effects. Scientists adding that the study found no cases of myocarditis, a type of heart inflammation, but some did experience fatigue, headache and pain at the injection site. Not all parents are convinced their kids should get the vaccine. Unless it becomes at the point where it's mandatory in order for them to actually attend school, then, then obviously that's going to come down to the wire. Immunization for 5 to 11 year olds includes two shots given three weeks apart, each at one third of the adult dose. Last week, the White House announced more than 25,000 pediatric and primary care providers have signed up to administer the vaccines. For my kids age 7 and 11, I'm waiting patiently, anxiously for the vaccine. We've talked to our pediatrician and I'm on board. If the shots get the sign off from both the FDA and CDC, 28 million children could be eligible for a vaccine. And by Christmas, some could even be fully protected. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. James Michael Tyler, an actor best known for playing Gunther on NBC's sitcom Friends, died of prostate cancer. He died peacefully in his Los Angeles home, aged 59. A few dozen people blocked roads in the Sudanese capital Khartoum after an apparent military coup. Eyewitness video shows people shouting slogans while tires burned in the streets, with one man calling saying the military had betrayed the civilians. Colombia's most wanted drug lord, Otto Neil, is to be extradited by the United States. Dairo Antonio Usuga was caught over the weekend in the rural area of Antiquia province. Over 500 special forces and 22 helicopters were involved in the operation. Lava continued erupting in the early hours from a collapsed cone of La Cumbre Vieja on the Atlantic island of La Palma. The eruption showed a few signs of abating after destroying some 2,000 buildings and forcing thousands to leave their homes. More than two months after the Taliban seized Kabul in a rapid conquest across the country, Afghans are ready to get caught up on the cricket fever as they rally behind their 2020 World Cup team. Indonesia will gradually reopen parts of the country where COVID-19 vaccination rates are above 70%. Its president Joko Widodo told a Southeast Asian business forum. And finally tonight, in the spirit of the Halloween season, a five-year-old boy grows pumpkins with his dad and donates the profits to charity. It's a big one. Too small. <laughs> they match, don't they? Like any good country boy, five-year-old Emmett Cox is proud of his crop. Four dollars. That could tell you how much one costs to take home. Five dollars. But what began as some father-son bonding last year has grown into something more. Their patch last season produced some 200 pumpkins, so many they weren't sure what to do with them all. We thought maybe this would be an opportunity for Emmett to learn how to, you know, make his own money and and manage funds. An honor system they set up on the side of the road. Every night he was excited to go out and get his, check the box and, and put the money in his jar. $400 later and some teaching at home about how money can be used to help others. He had mentioned his pumpkin money and I said, well, if you want to donate some of it, that's... That's perfectly fine. And right away he said, nope, I'm going to donate it all. He did to Toys for Tots. He got to do a little bit of a shopping spree and filled this cart. For a five-year-old to understand helping people, it's amazing. Okay. Friends and neighbors were back again this fall to pitch in. We didn't get very much this year. 
even if the crop wasn't as plentiful. As any good country boy knows, his weather patterns. Some of the seeds did not grow. That much rain. Still a successful harvest where it matters most. If a five-year-old can put others before himself, maybe, maybe we all can. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Shanali will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.